Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you to another pleasant night in the College of Complexes. The college consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period, then we're followed by a uh, speaker who will then speak up to an hour or thereabouts. Then we will have a question and answer period. And after that question and answer period, you will all have a chance to uh, talk and speak about the speaker on or off topic. Tonight's speaker will be David Ramsey Steele. Tonight, Dave, we're going to be talking about the good and bad in Sam Harris. An analysis by author and political commentator David Ramsey Steele. Samuel Harris is an American neuroscientist, philosopher, author, critic of religion, blogger, public intellectual, and podcast host. His work touches on a wide range of topics, including rationality, ethics, free will, neuroscience, meditation, philosophy of mind, politics, Islam, terrorism, and artificial intelligence. I'd like to give a big, round, rousing warm of applause for David Ramsey Steele. who may be paying attention. Um, I have a few things to say about Sam Harris. Um, I should say that I agree with some of the main themes in Sam Harris's thinking. Uh, he's an atheist, I'm an atheist. He's a materialist, I think, and I'm a materialist. Um, that is to say, I think our thoughts and ideas are identical with processes going on in our brain. Um, and. Um, He's a critic of religion, although I have some differences uh, in the way, with the way he criticizes religion. Now, um, Sam Harris uh, published a book in 2004 uh, called The End of Faith, and it was the first of a series of books that became known as The New Atheism. Um, and so it was followed up by uh, The God Delusion by uh, Richard Dawkins and God is Not Great, uh, by Christopher Hitchin. Um, and, um, and, and then other people wrote books as well, and people like Daniel Bennett. And uh, these, the people who came after Sam Harris were already famous, but Sam Harris was completely unknown um, to, until he published uh, that book, The End of Faith, that he made his entrance on the world stage, so to speak, with that book. Um, now, I personally disliked that book, The End of Faith, for, for various reasons. And my dissatisfaction with that book and with the other books by the New Atheists um, prompted me to write my own book, Advocating Atheism, which I did. It came out in 2008. It's called um, Atheism Explained. And it, uh, I'm a better writer than these people, and my arguments are more cogent. Um, and uh, generally speaking, the argument hangs together better. Um, and I don't make the silly mistakes about Christian doctrine or Islamic doctrine that they make. So you, you should read my book, Atheism Explained. It's still available on Alice. Can we somehow make the volume a little bit louder? I, I would love that. I don't know how to do it. Tim? Is that better? Yes. Good. Okay, now, one of the, one of the noticeable things, uh, one of the things that really hits you about uh, the, Harris's book, The End of Faith, and a lot of what he says about religion, is that, first of all, he never defines what religion is, but he tacitly defines it as involved in belief in God. Uh, and he is mainly against religion, it seems, uh, because it gives rise to all kinds of atrocities. So, um, the book, The End of Faith, was in a sense a response to 9-11. And what happened at 9-11 was uh, a bunch of uh, Saudis uh, 
flew planes into the into the uh, World Trade Center, and I, in my opinion, they really did, um, and um, and they killed uh, over 3,000 people. Actually, I've noticed that when people refer to it now, they say that um, they killed 3,000 Americans. No, uh, a lot of the people killed were not Americans. But, uh, but they killed um, 3,000 people, mostly Americans, but also of many other nationalities, including some Muslims. Now, I, my, my interpretation, or part of my interpretation of what's going on with people like Sam Harris is, these, they, they are lefty intellectuals. And lefty intellectuals didn't know quite how to respond to 9-11. Uh, because um, lefty intellectuals are... Um, uncomfortable with patriotism. Uh, and, and, and that's something where I sympathize with them. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with patriotism too. Um, okay, now it's a little uh, warm back here, And you think? they didn't quite know how to respond, but they eventually figured out a way to respond. And the, I think the, the story they came up with was this. The, the, the people who flew planes into the World Trade Center are essentially the same as people like Jerry Falwell. In other words, um, these are horrible people who believe in God. Um, and uh, they're responsible for um, all kinds of atrocities. He put it on 74. Now, there is, a, there is a, a serious problem with this whole approach to attacking religion. And that is that in the past 100 years, vastly more people have been killed in atrocities by atheists or by secularists who were not religious believers uh, than have ever been killed in the entire history of the human species by theists. So um, the, the regime in the Soviet Union uh, killed tens of millions of people, in some cases because they believed in God. Um, and the same, is, the, the same wouldn't be true of the Maoist regime in China. That killed tens of millions of people, not because they believed in God, because it, uh, God has never been a significant part of the Chinese uh, cultural experience, uh, but certainly because they had the wrong thoughts. So, um, and of course there have been other uh, regimes which have committed vast atrocities in the last hundred years. Uh, the National Socialist regime in, in uh, Germany killed millions of people, let's say 20, 30 million, something like that. And um, uh, the Let's say the leaders of the National Socialist Movement in Germany were not noted for their piety. Uh, it, the National Socialism, like fascism, was seen as an anti-Christian movement from the outset. Um, and, um, uh, you know, Catholics and Protestants, most Protestants in Germany were, were told not to vote for the Nazi party and not to join it. And, and, uh, and generally speaking, they didn't if they were true believers. So, so we have this picture of huge numbers of people being killed, tortured, terrorized, uh, maimed and, and injured uh, by atheist ideologies. Um, and th this, is, this is an obvious problem for, for people who go, like Sam Harris in The End of Faith, who go around saying, um, I'm against religion because it causes atrocities. <laughs> Um, re and religion means belief in God. It doesn't explicitly say that religion means belief in God, but that's what you tacitly pick up from reading this stuff. Um, so that is a problem. Uh, and I think that um, if you look at Sam Harris's writings, uh, he does, have, of course, he does have to deal with this objection. It's so obvious, uh, and he makes an attempt to do so. And what he, he says a number of different things. He says that uh, when Christians and Muslims kill people, they do, do it because they believe in God. But when atheists kill people, it's not because they don't believe in God. Well, I can't make any sense of that. Um, disbelief in God is, is an integral part of Marxism, and it's an integral part of Marxism-Leninism, uh, just as belief in God is an integral part of uh, Christianity and Islam. So uh, I, I don't really understand that sort of argument. Um, and the, but the other thing that he will say, and, uh, and the same is true of Dawkins and Hitchens, they will say, well, uh, things like National Socialism and Communism are really religions. So, so what they're doing is 
Uh, they're going on for 20 pages treating religion as equivalent to belief in God, but then faced with this objection, they say, well, no, religion isn't necessarily belief in God. It's, um, it's belief in what's unreasonable or what isn't supported by the evidence. Now, this, I think, uh, uh, raises a whole host of problems for the new atheists um, because they don't have a clear definition of religion. They have a kind of ad hoc definition of religion, which ultimately reduces to ideas they don't like. So it's ideas they disagree with that they call unreasonable or religious. Um, so this leads them into, into a rather um, curious position. Uh, Sam Harris uh, doesn't have a litmus test to distinguish reasonable ideas from unreasonable ideas. And incidentally, we know that there can be no lit such litmus test. Right? Because, uh, you know, because of Karl Popper and other philosophers, we can be sure that there can never be uh, a simple test to, distinct, to say that this set of ideas is reasonable and this set of ideas is unreasonable. No, that, that's not anything we can ever, <clears throat> we can ever uh, come up with. So, um, it's, well, I, I, I want to pursue this idea of uh, atheist atrocities a little bit longer to show that it's not just communism and national socialism. Um, there are other instances of where um, atheists have killed a lot of people. Uh, in the 1920s, the government of Mexico um, stepped up its campaign against the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and a lot of uh, priests and devout Catholics were slaughtered uh, by the Mexican government. Uh, and there, was, there occurred the episodes known as the Cristero Wars between Catholics and secularists. It appears from what little I know about this whole portion of history, that, that, that these anti-God, anti anti-theistic ideas that, that uh, seized the government at that time came from positivism. Positivism was based on the ideas of Auguste Comte, and it's a kind of proto-Marxism. It's a form of socialism that predated Marxism. Uh, and it, so it's not, it's, just, it's definitely socialism, but it's socialism with all kinds of metaphysical, or, Paul wouldn't say metaphysical, but philosophical trappings. Uh, and um, so th this, this doctrine of positivism, which was definitely against uh, theistic religion, and especially the Catholic Church, uh, got hold of intellectuals in, all, all over the world uh, in the European sphere of influence, but it's, it, it especially got hold of people in Mexico. So, um, Graham Green who was a Catholic writer in the 30s and 40s. Um, he, in 1939, he published a book, a non-fiction reporting book about this called uh, The Lawless Roads. And the following year, he published a novel, which is, dramatizes this whole period in Mexican history, uh, called The Power and the Glory. Um, personally, I think that Graham Greene is uh, greatly overestimated as a novelist, but it is worth reading The Power and the Glory. Uh, and it, it, and the, fact, the factual background to it is absolutely authentic. You know, this did happen. Um, so hostile has the Mexican regime been to theistic religion, and especially the Catholic Church, that when um, Vicente uh, Fox uh, was elected in 2000 uh, to become president of Mexico, that was the first time in 90 years that it was possible, that it was felt safe for the president to admit to being a believing Catholic. Uh, so that's one, that's one episode. Another interesting episode is what went on in Spain, in the, especially in the lead up to the Civil War, so we're talking about the 20s and early 30s. Um, there were all kinds of anti-Catholic outrages committed by atheists in Spain. Uh, in the countryside, they were mainly anarcho-communists in the mold of Mikhail Bakunin. Uh, 
and they would um, kill priests uh, and monks, um, destroy churches and monasteries, rape and then kill nuns, um, just because they were priests and monks and nuns. Uh, and this was um, because of this Bakuninist, anarchist ideology that was very popular in certain parts of the countryside in Spain. Uh, in the urban centers, there was a similar anti-Catholic uh, zeal uh, displayed by members of the Socialist Party of Spain. Um, and um, the Socialist Party was divided into different factions, and they weren't all um, equally guilty of this, but there were a lot of outrages, a lot of atrocities uh, against uh, Catholics, and especially against priests and monks and nuns. A lot of them were um, killed in imaginative ways. Uh, and uh, the churches were desecrated and destroyed. Uh, so this was part of the whole complex of events that led to the Spanish Civil War. Uh, when uh, General Franco and some other officers decided to seize power uh, in, I think it was April uh, 1936, thus causing the Spanish Civil War, which most people thought would be over one way or another within a week or two, but actually went on until 1939. Um, uh, this, this was a response to um, vicious, violent attacks by the atheistic left upon Catholics and other people uh, in Spain. This was one of the main things that caused the Spanish, Spanish Civil War. Um, and this is why uh, the, the, the general's regime uh, had so much popular support in Spain and why they eventually won was because of this anti-Catholic uh, fury that had been unleashed by the, by the atheistic left in Spain. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was very unfashionable to criticize this in any way. Uh, as some of you know, I've written a book about George Orwell. George Orwell actually went to Spain and fought for, uh, for the Republican side against Spain. Um, and uh, <clears throat> George Orwell, when he talks about the anti-Catholic atrocities of the atheistic left, uh, obviously views it with some admiration, because he had his head filled with this idea of a uh, romantic proletarian revolution, which has always been a delusion and, uh, and a, a hopeless kind of fantasy. Uh, but Orwell never once criticized um, the, uh, the left for its um, anti-Catholic atrocities. Uh, so, <clears throat> These are some of the um, uh, some of the uh, episodes where uh, atheists have, have committed, uh, uh, you know, atrocities on a vast scale. Um, you know, it's interesting that when you when you read back in the 2004 2005, you read um, Harris and then Dawkins and then Hitchens. They all they all sort of. Um, Actually, they all mention in different ways something like this. They will say, how can you possibly imagine an atheist uh, ever becoming a suicide bomber? <laughs> Unthinkable, right? Well, as a matter of fact, um, in the period from 1983 to, uh, let's say, um, 2009, let's say, in that period, um, the, the majority of suicide bombers in the world were atheists because uh, the biggest uh, bunch of suicide bombers were the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. Um, they kill, killed a huge number of people um, in a vast number of suicide bombing episodes. Uh, they were all atheists. They mostly came from Hindu backgrounds, uh, but they were atheists. And in fact, they were not just atheists. It was part of their creed uh, to stamp out theistic religion. So they were big suicide bombers. And there were there have been other cases of atheistic suicide bombers, uh, like PKK, um, the Kurdish group uh, in Turkey. But uh, they were atheists, and their victims were Muslims. Um, they were suicide bombers. Now, of course, after about 2009, 2010, those, although they went away or changed their views or <laughs> different things happened. And since about 2010, you can say the vast majority of suicide bombers have been Muslims. That's true. Uh, but um, it, the, the whole idea, oh, how unthinkable that atheists could be suicide bombers. Um, the thing about suicide bombing 
Um, and this is relevant because Harris um, dogmatically asserts that the main reason that we have suicide bombing is because Muslims believe that martyrdom will get them into paradise, uh, where they will experience the attentions of 72 virgins. Um, and I, when I was about 16, I would have said 72 wasn't enough. <laughs> uh, now I'm 75, and I would say um, 72 is 71 too many. Uh, but um, uh, uh, now I, I have met Muslims who have told me that it's a mistranslation, and it should uh, it should um, it should read raisins. So, so you get we go to paradise, you get 72 raisins, which uh, just confirms my view, politically incorrect statement coming up, that, that Islam isn't much fun. Um, so, so um, we have this situation where um, the suicide bombers um, are, are um, that uh, Harris says the suicide bombers uh, are suicide bombers just because um, uh, they think they'll go to paradise. Uh, be, because they'd be martyred. Now, I think this is th uh, this is one of the main one of the main themes of, of Harris's pronouncement on Islam. I think it's wrong. Um, I think, first of all, one thing you have to understand is that suicide bombing works. It's very effective. Uh, if you if you want to uh, cause an explosion and kill a lot of people, um, the actual outlay in um, equipment and chemicals and so on um, would be about a thousand dollars and you'll need to um, study up on it you need to go to night school for some of the technical um, aspects of it uh, it's been calculated by people who've analyzed this that if you're prepared to kill yourself you get 12 times as many on average victims as if you try to save your own life. So, so um, this makes um, this makes suicide bombing a very rational and effective uh, approach. And of course, if you if you look back at the history, like of war movies and things like that, the idea that you you're going to almost certain death or even certain death is always treated as quite glamorous. Uh, so uh, there's a, a long history of uh, to go out and knowingly kill yourself in order to do something really damaging to the enemy is a wonderful thing. So it's not an entirely alien uh, concept. Um, the, uh, the, the Robert Pape and his group at the University of Chicago have been studying um, suicide bombing since um, about 2003, uh, and they 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 act they. they tabulate every single case of suicide bombing uh, that's ever occurred in the world and they analyze, get all the information they can, who are the people, where did they come from, what's their religious background, what's their education, um, how were they recruited, um, and they've got, a, they've got the, the perfect database of suicide bombing. Uh, and Pape's conclusion is that the overwhelming majority of suicide bombings are responses to foreign military occupation. Uh, so that, um, and, th and, this, and this, this is statistically borne out, the, 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 number of, the number of suicide bombings that can't easily be fitted into that pattern, like the uh, Shali Hebdo uh, case, uh, are very, a very tiny proportion. The vast majority of suicide bombings and the vast majority of victims of suicide bombings it's related to um, foreign military occupation. So um, when the United States put troops into Afghanistan, um, first of all, they just put troops in Kabul to protect the, the government, and they didn't go out into the countryside much. And there were some suicide bombings, but not many. Then later, they changed their strategy, and they sent their troops out all over Afghanistan, uh, bothering people in their daily lives, interrupting them searching their houses and doing all this kind of thing, it's just a way to make friends and influence people. Uh, and the, the number of suicide bombings in Afghanistan uh, skyrocketed 
And the huge majority of these suicide bombings, well over 95%, uh, were conducted by native Afghans. So it's not like there's an international um, brotherhood of suicide bombers that just commit them randomly. It, this is uh, a response of people who are militarily weak uh, to foreign occu military occupation of the place where they live and where they grew up. Um, if, you know, if you look at 9-11, it was done by Saudis. Uh, and the, and the, the, um, <clears throat> the main aim of 9-11 of was to get um, the American combat troops withdrawn from Saudi Arabia. And that happened 18 months later. So it was a successful operation. Um, uh, it worked. So I don't see much of a mystery. Uh, about, and if you read Pate, he's got two books. One is called uh, Dying to Win, uh, and the other one is called uh, Cutting the Feuds, more recent, a bigger database, um, <coughs> co authored with another guy. Um, and uh, you see that he makes an overwhelming case for, uh, that by scientifically analyzing all this data, um, it's not at all plausible to think that. Um, that suicide bombing happens because Muslims want to go to paradise. And of course, there is the point that for centuries before the 1980s, um, there were no suicide bombings <laughs> committed by Muslims anywhere. Uh, there were suicide bombings committed by European anarchists who were also atheists, you know, when they would uh, try and blow up the Tsar or some other uh, European um, uh, ro royalty. Um, there were some of those, and you, you know, you people in Europe in the 19th century were aware of this as a, as a possible thing. They didn't have the word terrorist at that point, and they tended to refer to them all as anarchists. But if you read things like The, the Stolen Bacillus by H.G. Wells, short story, or if you read The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad, you'll see how it's part of the consciousness of educated people in Europe that there were these um, people who would go and kill, blow themselves up and kill some important person or some uh, a group of people. Uh, and the anarchists who preach this use the phrase propaganda by deed. Because, of course, it's not just true that, um, that uh, you get 12 times as many people. It's also true that the message you send is more intimidating. If you're prepared to die, that's a very intimidating thing. Uh, if, you, okay, if you want to shoot, kill a lot of people but get away and save your own skin, well, that's, that's a hazard and, um, uh, you know, that's something to be concerned about. But if you're prepared to die, that's, that sends a chilling message uh, that here is something formidable. Uh, and um, one of the other things that emerges from Pape's researches into suicide bombing is that the suicide bombers are well aware of the difference between democracies and totalitarian regimes. So there were no suicide bombings against the Soviet Union when they were occupying Afghanistan. Because the, the, the suicide bombers are not fools. They know that if they have a successful suicide bombing in a Western country, it will be reported in the media, uh, and it will uh, increase the uh, demands for withdrawal. Uh, whereas if in, in a, in, in, with a regime like the Soviet Union, this doesn't, or it doesn't, it happens, but of course it happens in a secretive way and therefore it's much, it can be much delayed because uh, they don't have to admit what actually happened. Uh, and um, even if they did, they don't have like uh, an opposition calling for a different uh, foreign policy. So uh, I think th if you read Pape's two books, um, then I think you, you, are, you will be convinced that, uh, that um, the, the, the root cause of, so by the way, I should mention that there were no suicide bombings before the early 80s. You know, in all, in all the, um, in all the, the uh, Arab, Israel, uh, Israeli, Palestinian question, all those conflicts in 1947, 1948, 1949, and later, there were, ne there were never any suicide bombings. What happened was that People who are small, weak groups in ethnicities that feel oppressed and occupied by foreigners, uh, they're, they're, some of them quite right, 
uh, they, they are all online now, but in, back in those days they read the newspapers, they watch TV. Uh, and there, were, there was one very successful suicide bombing, I think it was in 83, uh, when the, the US had a couple of thousand troops in Lebanon, and nobody thought too much about this. One guy with a truck killed several hundred of them. And um, uh, Ronald Reagan was no idiot. <laughs> and he got all the troops out of Lebanon uh, within the next couple of months. Um, and uh, because you could see that, you could see the potential there. Now, all the people interested in committing terrorist acts all over the world were aware, were aware of that. And so this is why you've got the Tamil Tigers. They picked up on that right away and started imitating it because they realized what, what a really potent um, weapon this is. Of course, you have to have people committed enough to be prepared to kill themselves. Yeah, you have to have that. But generally speaking, in poor third world countries where um, the average couple has about 10 children um, and where there's a sense of hopelessness and there's a sense of resentment against the foreign occupier, uh, it's not usually too difficult to, um, to get those people. So um, now, I think one of the things that misleads Harris into thinking that it's all due to what... See, Harris argues that the difference that we, we're, we're fearful of Muslims, but we're not fearful of Christians. Therefore, Christianity is more benign than Islam. Um, and he puts that down to the fact that the Quran is full of injunctions to kill the enemy, which is true. Um, whereas the New Testament isn't, although, of course, the Christian Bible includes the Old Testament. In fact, four-fifths of the Christian Bible is the Old Testament. And there, there are plenty of injunctions to kill the enemy, pick up their babies and smash their heads against the wall, and um, all that kind of thing. Um, so the, the, the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures, are just filled with genocidal propaganda, uh, which is uh, implicitly endorsed by Christianity because they include it as part of their Bible. Um, but I, but uh, the, apart from all that, um, I think that this is an oversimple view of the relation between what a religious text says and how people behave. Uh, you know, um, I don't know, but, uh, de decades ago I read the Bhagavad Gita, and um, I read it, and I thought, well, this is very interesting. Um, it's, it's a better, better piece of literature than anything in the New Testament, and better than all but about six <coughs> things in the Old Testament. Um, and, um, uh, but why do, I've heard people talk about this. Why do they never mention that the whole point of the Bhagavad Gita is to convince this guy who's having qualms about slaughtering other people in warfare, including members of his family, that he ought to go through with it? Why does nobody ever mention that fact about the Bhagavad Gita? So I, 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 met, I have to, spoke to a few people who I thought you might know something about Hinduism, and they all said, oh, you're being, you're being David, you're being terribly simple-minded. That's not what it really means. Uh, I never have found out what it really means, actually. But, uh, but uh, uh, there is a gap between what a sacred text says and, what, and, and the, the way that affects people's behavior. Um, and if you look at the whole history of Christianity, for example, you see the great variety of ways in which people have interpreted scripture. Um, and um, it, it's rarely that simple that it says, do this, and then, um, and then, and then uh, people go and do it. Uh, you know, um, that, that's, uh, I, uh, there's not, I've, I've not met many Christians who will turn the other cheek if you sock them in the, in the face. Um, and, um, you know, so uh, liter literal uh, transposition from what the scripture says to what you do is not all that common. Uh, it, as everybody will say, you have to interpret it. Um, so, those are a few things about, this is why I reject Sam Harris's um, uh, take on, on Islam. He thinks that the reason, he, Sam Harris thinks that the reason we have terrorist outrages such as suicide bombings is because it's in the Quran and the Hadith. Um, and um, I don't think that's correct. Um, and I think if you look at the history of Europe, of medieval Europe and medieval Islam, Islamdom, uh, whatever we want to call it, uh, uh, during the period, let's say, after the Moors had been driven out of Spain up until the, the, the 16th century, let's say. I don't think you get a picture that um, 
that Islam was more barbaric or more violent than Christianity. Uh, that's not the picture I get at all. I mean, I happen to be interested, among other things, in um, early 17th century England. Uh, that's uh, that's um, Elizabeth and James I uh, before the English Civil War, which broke out in uh, 1642. Now, um, huge numbers of people in Elizabeth's England were beheaded. And many of them were beheaded because they said the wrong thing or thought the wrong thing. Um, and um, there were three things that could get you beheaded <laughs> in Elizabethan England, right? Uh, one was, one was um, being a Catholic. Well, okay, that's understandable. Um, uh, another th because the Catholics were plotting to, to assassinate Elizabeth and overthrow, uh, overthrow the, um, the English uh, monarchy and replace it with a, a, a more um, correct one. Um, then the, the second would be if you were an atheist. So Christopher Marlowe was suspected of being an atheist. And um, uh, so many people think that was why he was killed. But of course, the correct line is that he wasn't killed. His death was faked, and he went to Italy and started writing what became known as the plays of Shakespeare. Um, and the, but the third thing was to be a Puritan. Uh, now, if you're a Puritan, it wouldn't necessarily get you beheaded, but you had to keep quiet about it. Uh, any of those three things um, would get you beheaded. And a lot of people, we think, you know, uh, were beheaded in this period. Walter Raleigh was eventually beheaded under James. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, beheading, by the way, was the best form of execution. Uh, that was the most humane form of execution, and that's why people with noble birth usually got beheaded. Um, people who were further down the social scale didn't go out so neatly and quickly. Um, so, um, I mean, I, one little episode from the, Queen, from the reign of Queen Elizabeth I mentioned. There was a guy who... Uh, who wrote, wrote a little pamphlet and got it printed. And, and, the, and they were very hazardous. And, um, and the, the, the burden of this pamphlet was that Queen Elizabeth shouldn't marry a Catholic. There were rumors that she was going to marry this particular Catholic prince. And so it cautioned against this. Now, <clears throat> this guy who wrote that pamphlet and the printer who printed it were treated extremely mercifully. They were not beheaded, they just had their right hands chopped off. Um, and this was a common thing, that people had written something or printed something that was um, uh, incorrect, uh, uh, politically incorrect. Uh, they would get their hands chopped off. Uh, and um, it was just like a beheading, except that you, instead of stretching your neck out so that the axe would fall, you stretched out your arm. And remember, the, the concept of um, Anesthetics was completely unknown in those days, except for rum. <laughs> that was about the only thing. Uh, but um, so, you know, um, if you look at the, the Queen Elizabeth and the first James, um, you don't have a sense that this is necessarily a humane society <laughs> uh, compared with, the, with what was going on at the time in North Africa or, or, or other, other parts of um, of uh, the Islamic world. Now, uh, you, you, to do to get a proper comparison, you'd have to do a comparative cleometric study and look at the number of executions and so on and so forth. Uh, although it is worth mentioning that in the Islamic world, Jews and Christians were allowed to exist. Uh, they had to pay higher taxes. They didn't have the same legal rights as Muslims. Uh, there was a lot of pressure put on them to convert to Islam, but they could exist and. Jewish and Christian communities did exist in the Muslim world for many centuries, whereas it wasn't so clear uh, in the Christian world. Well, the Muslims were just not allowed. That would, you just disappeared from the face of the earth. Uh, Jews, they, they blew hot and cold. If they needed to borrow money, if the king needed to borrow money because they didn't have a modern system of taxation, then they might allow some Jewish emergency. But they, you know, um, who knows what might happen to them. Um, and uh, you think about things like, I, the story of Ivanhoe shows you what happens to uh, Jewish merchants. Uh, they're, always, uh, they're always at the mercy of the whim of the, uh, of the rule, rulers at that time. So in that sense, there was a bit more tolerance in the Islamic world uh, than there was in the Christian world. Although I wouldn't say it was a model of tolerance or anything like that. Uh, certainly not, but it was a little bit better uh, than, than in the Christian world. Um, so. 
Um, I'll try to get to wrap this up quickly. Um, anyone who takes up a, a, a position on any point of view uh, will always claim that the evidence supports their point of view and goes against the, uh, uh, the, the, the point of view of their opponents. So this is not something that is unique to Sam Harris and people who preach uh, science and atheism and so on and so forth. Um, this is, uh, if you talk to, I've talked to dozens of, of uh, theists, mainly Christians, and I've never ever um, met one who said, oh yeah, the evidence is all against me, uh, but I have faith. I've never met that. It doesn't exist. Uh, this is a, a fantasy in the minds of atheists that Christians think like that. No, um, they, they, uh, they say the evidence supports their point of view. And this is why they're always trying to do things like refute uh, the Darwinian theory of evolution. Um, <clears throat> because they can see that uh, that's an important. But, um, basically, Darwinian evolution doesn't prove uh, atheism, but uh, it does refute the most popular argument for theism, which is the uh, argument from design. Um, and uh, therefore, it's the argument from design. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, in, fact, in fact, there are different kinds of argument from design. And the one that is most popular, if you talk to ordinary people about why they believe what they believe, and you find someone who believes in God, and they haven't been, they're not university professors, they're just ordinary layabouts like you and me, uh, they, they will say, well, it, isn't it wonderful how the natural world um, yeah, it's wonderful, and all, all, the, uh, all the poisonous snakes and uh, scorpions are just uh, wonderful too. They must have been uh, crafted by a benign creator. Uh, but anyway, that's what they believe. Um, so uh, that's the most popular argument, I think, uh, for, the, uh, for the existence of God and it, uh, among the general population. Uh, and uh, Darwinism does refute, if, if true, Darwinism, which I think it is, Darwinism does refute that. So, um, it's, so it's very important to uh, theists and atheists, the whole question of Darwinism. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, talking about Harris and how he, he, he thinks it's sort of self-evident that there are reasonable beliefs and unreasonable beliefs. Um, as I said, the can, that can, ne can never be self-evident. Uh, it's uh, because there's always, because, because reality is so much more complicated than our theories. Um, so our theories can never catch up with reality. So it's always possible something is escaping us. Um, I mean, just think about all the millions of people who were killed by communism, especially uh, by Stalin, but a lot of them were killed previously under the uh, Lenin uh, regime. Um, uh, I happen to know quite a bit about Marxism. Um, and um, I can tell you this. That if you'd met a Marxist in, let's say, the year 1910, right? Um, first of all, consider what Marxism was at that point. It was a political tendency in Europe. Uh, in continental Europe, basically every country had a large socialist party, also called a social democratic party, controlled ideologically controlled by Marxists. What were the, what were the tenets of this Marxism? Well, among the tenets of this Marxism was complete adherence to democracy, complete opposition to uh, minority conspiracies and coups and putsches and so on, um, and um, a trust in the education of the proletariat, which would in the fullness of time bring about, um, bring about a, a socialist revolution by largely peaceful means. And it would be regrettable if there was resistance that would have to be put down, but basically um, the, the, uh, the capitalists and reactionaries would see how lost their position was and they wouldn't resist. So this was, if you'd say to a Marxist in 1910, just suppose that in a few years' time there's going to be a new heretical brand of Marxism, which is going to believe in minority conspiracies, which is going to be totally opposed to democracy and stamp it out which is going to be a minority dictatorship, which is going to be in a peasant country instead of an advanced industrial country, which is going to deliberately cause famines that kill millions of people, uh, which is going to set up um, slave labor camps, and he's going to set out to enslave the entire peasantry, turn the peasantry into chattel slaves, which is precisely what collectivization of agriculture means. 
Uh, that, that, that Marxist in 1910 would have looked at you and said, well, that's never, nothing like that. That's fantastic. Nothing like that could ever happen. And you can't tell what turns history will take in the, in the development of ideas. Uh, and we should, which, so my view is there are people, people, people have belief systems, and there are enthusiastic belief systems that people are very strongly committed to. Um, and there was a time when these were mainly uh, to do with supernatural entities like gods. Um, but as, uh, as society developed, uh, they became more and more based on science. So you have scientific enthusiastic belief systems, uh, or pseudo-scientific enthusiastic belief systems. So um, I don't believe, like Harris, I don't believe in God. Uh, I also don't believe in the class struggle or surplus value. Um, I also don't believe in repressed memories or the unconscious mind. I also don't believe in Jungian archetypes. I also don't believe that robots or computers can ever become conscious. And hence, I don't believe that we could possibly be living in a simulation. Um, I think that ideas like that, which are very popular today and sound scientific, are um, just as uh, untenable as the idea that there is a heaven and hell. Um, I also, as you probably know, I don't believe in the uh, pseudo-scientific cult of global warming. Uh, I don't believe that the, uh, the very slight increase in the world's temperature, which has happened as we rebound from the Little Ice Age for the past 300 years, uh, is, co is mainly caused by emission, human emissions of CO2. Yeah. Or, is, or poses any kind of serious danger. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, any, but you can see how uh, skepticism about things um, is not just a matter of picking on uh, one particular type of, of idea, such as theism. I don't, I'm, theism I regard as totally untenable, but I don't think it's any more untenable than all kinds of modern superstitions. Um, so, uh, one of the things I don't have time to cover, it would be very interesting, but it's highly philosophical, and therefore would send some people to sleep, uh, is Harris has, uh, has written a book and has given many lectures opposing the idea of free will. Um, and says there's no such thing as free will, we can't control what we do. Um, and, um, uh, it's easy to see. Now, I think that's completely wrong, and I can refute him a hundred different ways. Uh, but I think it's easy to see how this belief that there is no free will could lead to some kind of totalitarian despotism in the future. You know, once you think there is no such thing as free will, well, what does it really matter if we change this little bit that's going on in your brain um, to make you uh, a more can conforming and responsible member of society. Well, it doesn't matter at all, obviously. So, uh, so uh, you, you don't know sometimes um, what direction some of these things will, will take. Now, the whole the global warming thing, um, basically global warming, people don't take it seriously. Um, they, they don't, um, they don't uh, we're, not, we're not insisting that China, which is the main emitter of carbon dioxide, uh, do anything serious in the next 20 years. Uh, instead, we're going to penalize uh, a, a, a few people who, who are <coughs> creating carbon dioxide in the United States and Western Europe, which is not the problem, if there is a problem. Um, but you can, you can see how there could be um, some kind of super enthusiastic uh, takeover of governments around the world by people who believe in this global warming stuff. And what would they do? Well, they'd drive up the price of energy. And thus, they would kill uh, millions of third world babies. Um, and that, so this is what would happen if you were to take it seriously. Uh, you would be, um, you'd be killing the poor uh, because cheap energy is the key to the liberation and enrichment of the lives of the majority of people on this planet. Uh, they're suffering because they're poor. Uh, and the most important form of poverty is lack of access to energy. Um, so, um, one thing I want to mention is that, um, and I, I remember years ago, back in 2004, when I read The, uh, the End of Faith by Sam Harris, I was quite shocked. Um, and I, 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 I think it's amazing to me that people didn't make more of this at the time. 
Um, he, one of the things that Harris tells us in that book is that belief is not a private matter. And that's a, first of all, that's a chilling thing to say because the whole idea that belief is a private matter is the key to classical liberalism, which is that, that you can't be dragged off by the police for what you're thinking. Right? This is why, this is why um, the thought police is such a, a, a frightening term in Orwell's 1984, because uh, we don't want to empower the government to control how people think. Um, now, in case you, you might think, well, he says that belief is not a private matter, but he didn't really mean it. This is, this is, from, this is from the end of Fed, right, 2003, um, or 2004. Um, quote from Sam Harris, some propositions are so dangerous that it may even be ethical to kill people for believing them. That's Sam Harris. Uh, and he's had no, as, as far as I know, he's never repudiated that. Um, so, um, uh, uh, just imagine if Jerry Falwell or, uh, or um, Pat Roberts, Robertson had said something like that. Uh, you know, if, yes, if people have the wrong ideas, it may be okay to kill them. Just imagine uh, the fuss that the atheists would be making. Um, now, you know, uh, Harris has come under, under um, criticism because of things he said about Islam. And uh, I'm, I'm really quite sympathetic to Harris um, because uh, there seems to be a segment of the left which thinks that Islam should be given a privileged position where it's okay to criticize Christianity, but you can't criticize Islam. And I think that's wrong. I think that you should be able to criticize both systems of ideas to an equal extent. Now, you may have arguments about what's permissible and how much it's wise to offend people, um, but, um, but uh, I think they should be treated on a par. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, um, on the Bill Maher show, uh, uh, Ben Affleck made a, uh, went into an apoplectic rage because of something Sam Harris said about this uh, and attacked um, attacked Sam Harris viciously verbally, I mean, uh, and, um, and it subsequently, over the next uh, few months, that what Ben Affleck said was endorsed by most of the lefties on the internet. Uh, uh, where, what was, what was uh, Sam Harris saying? He was simply saying that it's an arguable position. He was simply saying that uh, there is something in Islam that tends to make people more prone um, to, to commit um, to, to commit uh, atrocities, suicide bombing, and all the rest of it, uh, because they wanted to uh, go to paradise and have uh, 72 virgins. So, uh, so um, I, I'm entirely on the side of Sam Harris when it comes to political correctness stopping us making um, critical remarks about Islam. In my book on atheism, I have a chapter on the New Testament and I have a chapter on Islam. And both of them, I, I uh, argue against uh, what they're saying. Uh, so, um, and I think that that's what we should do, since Islam is the second biggest religion in the world after Christianity and is growing more rapidly than Christianity, uh, we ought to give some attention to it as a theistic system. I, um, I would say this, by the way, that... Um, uh, Islam as a system of belief is less absurd than Christianity. Um, and I, the reason I say that is there are three great absurdities in Christianity. Uh, the one absurdity is the, is the Trinity. I, there, there are three persons, but they're not three gods, they're just one God. That's absurd. Um, secondly, original sin. The fact that because um, that diabolical Eve, Hava, uh, tempted Adam to um, eat this fruit, and I got into an argument the other day about what kind of fruit it was, and I said, well, obviously it was passion fruit. Um, but anyway, um, uh, because of that, we all find it more difficult to, uh, to behave correctly, and so we're therefore uh, totally depraved. And the third, uh, the third absurd thing in Christianity is the atonement. You know, the idea that the, the entity that made the universe, and that knows all, of, knows all the scientific laws that are true, uh, knows all about quantum gravity, Right, is uh, feels obliged to be to follow blood sacrifice, follow the, the, the protocols of blood sacrifice. That's absurd. 
So we have three really big absurd things that are absolutely central to Christianity. And you don't have anything quite so absurd uh, in Islam. So I have put in a good word uh, for, for Islam there. It is a bit more, a bit less absurd than Christianity. Um, and uh, of course there are absurd things in, the, in, in Islam. You know, there is um, there's a passage where um, the ants uh, are being attacked by uh, by Solomon's <coughs> armies that are dropping bricks on them. And one ant says to the other, hey, get out of the way because Solomon's coming and he's dropping these bricks on us. Well, um, uh, ants don't have the intellectual equipment to make uh, articulate uh, speak, you know, to, to utter sentences. Um, and um, uh, it's questionable whether ants are conscious at all, actually. But um, even so, they are. It's a very, very dim uh, and limited form of consciousness, and they don't have that kind of conversation. So uh, that's, that, there are silly things like that in the Quran. Uh, but of course, you can, you can, um, you can always take these in a certain sense uh, and defend them. I mean, I was talking to one Muslim, and I said I mentioned the thing about seventy-two virgins, and I was interested in his, his opinion as to whether it was seventy-two raisins. Um, and he said, "Well, you know, you have to bear in mind that in another surah it says." that paradise is indescribable. So how can you reconcile saying that in paradise you'll have 72 virgins or raisins um, uh, with the statement that paradise is indescribable? What is it, the obvious way to reconcile them is that when you say something like you'll have 72, the men will have 72 virgins, presumably the women will have, uh, no, that's not the way their minds work. Uh, but anyway, uh, um, uh, presumably, um, Presumably, uh, the way to reconcile this is to say that it must be figurative. Because what it's saying is, imagine the, the most blissful thing you can think of. Well, paradise would be like that. Uh, but it won't be like that because it's indescribable. So that's a way to reconcile those two. And I, think, I think you can do a lot of things like that with scripture, right? whether it's the Quran or the Hadith or the, the Old and New Testament. Personally, my favorite is the New Testament. but. Um, uh, I, there are all kinds of things you can do with that. But anyway, <coughs> um, I think I'm, I'm drawing to a close here. Um, I think that um, uh, Robert Pape, who is who is put forward the argument that uh, foreign occupation, foreign military occupation, is the main um, generator of uh, suicide terrorism. He calls for a um, uh, um, less boots on the ground in Muslim countries, more uh, what he calls offshore, uh, offshore balancing or something like that, um, and uh, less, uh, more indirect intervention. Um, and he says that if you do put boots on the ground, you should try and work with the locals uh, rather than suppress the locals. Um, now, what a brilliant idea! <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Nobody in the Pentagon would come up with that one unless Robert Pate called. Now, actually, um, I'm a bit more non-interventionist in my general outlook uh, than even Robert Pape. I, I would say there's no compulsion to just keep on intervening in the affairs of, um, of other countries. And, and we, whatever may have been the case in the past, I don't think it was ever the case that we needed Middle Eastern oil. But it's certainly not the case today. Um, we don't need Middle Eastern oil. So spending billions upon billions every year to put troops into places like um, Afghanistan, I think, is, uh, is a bad idea. We, and by the way, that's why I would have, although it looks as though I won't have the opportunity, I would have voted for Tulsi Gabbard in the, in the 2020 election, uh, because she's the one credible person who is arguing intelligently for this disengagement from the Middle East on the part of the United States. But sadly, uh, she's too sane for the political world. <laughs> and so she's not going to be a candidate, not going to be the nominee. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with that, I think I will uh, close and invite your um, uh, no doubt well justified denunciation. <laughs> I'd like your uh, comments on the uh, sacred text of the Chicago Cubs, if you got what Sam Harris may have said about those guys. 
if I'm, possible. I'm not actually aware of what he said about the colors. No. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Sophia. Are you an atheist? Yes. You can read my book, Atheism Explained. Sir, in the back. But if you notice, I'm usually fan <laughs> Sir, in the back. First off, I'd like to say I found your, I want to thank you for being here. I found your remarks very interesting. But I do have a couple of disagreements. No, I have a question, sir. Okay, well, first I want to... Formulate your disagreements as questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. Marxists consider patriotism, like Mark Twain said, patriot is 100% loyal to his country and to his government when they deserve it. I think that's most Marxist definition of patriotism. Okay? And as far as famine under Stalin, I think that's a case of don't let the facts in on the way of a good story. I think that is the definition of the big lie that Hitler preached time and time again. Okay. Um, that. Um, Did Stalin actually create a famine? Is that oh, a fact okay. or is that oh, okay. your opinion? Randolph Peirce was caught time and time again pitting okay. phony pictures of supposed okay. famine victims okay. in his magazine. All right, may, yeah. I, may I remind you yeah. that you will get a chance. And it worked so well that they used it on mouth. Okay. It worked so well no against Stalin, okay. they used it on mouth. Thank you. We will uh, give you a, as a reminder. Uh, as a reminder uh, to the comments. The New York Times, the New York Times, you can do a rebuttal, sir. The New York Times, an appeal to the order. When they said that there is no famine, the New York Times. Uh, I will get a chance to I, I, I would just say this. Um, the second volume of Stephen Hopkins' monumental work on Stalin is out. Um, it's called Waiting for Hitler, the second volume. And um, uh, the third volume is going to be after the, from, the set, from 22nd of June, 19. 41 until Stalin's death. Uh, but um, uh, he, he, he's had access to a, a huge amount of new documentation that wasn't available a few years ago, uh, which became available because of the fall of the Soviet Union uh, documentation came out. And he gives a wealth of evidence as to what happened. It was deliberate, uh, deliberately caused famine that killed millions of people in Ukraine. Um, and um, uh, you can read, I would recommend that you read, read volume one as well, but read volume two of Stephen Copkin's book, and you'll see the massive evidence that we have. This is what, this is Questions, uh, Jane, Jim. Um, my, my question is about science. Now, uh, my question, what do you think of scientific evidence? Uh, for example, uh, for example, um, this guy Arrhenius from a long time ago, whose great-granddaughter now is known as um, Greta Thunberg, um, he and his predecessors showed that uh, carbon dioxide <coughs> absorbs heat and that... And, I'm just wondering what you, how, how you discount the uh, scientific evidence for the idea that carbon dioxide absorbs heat, and because of it, the 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 okay. atmosphere is warming. That, okay. I just want okay. to. Uh, first of all, I, nobody disputes that the atmosphere has been warming and is continuing to warm. It's been doing that for about 300 years, very slowly, uh, but it's but, and um, it does this every. 1,350 years. It did it. It did it in um, medieval times, medieval warming. It did it in Roman times, the Roman warming. It did it in the Minoan times, and it goes back. And, the, and you, one thing, another thing you'll notice is that each of these warming periods that happen, say, every 1,300 years, roughly, um, uh, each of these, they're all taking place within an interglacial. The interglacial lasts, uh, let's say. No, probably no more than 15,000 years. Uh, the, the glaciation that precedes the interglacial and will follow it lasts for more than 100,000 years. Um, so we're, we're living in this interglacial. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, the, there is no signal in the warming that this warming is at all unusual. 
All right. Nothing. I have yeah. to cut you off. We okay. have a lot of just questions. Just yes, sir. Yeah, so I have um, actually two independent questions. So the first is to know, you mentioned that uh, positivism is a form of Marxism, that, uh, is, is a form of socialism that existed before, uh, before Marxism. So would you say that um, the notion of positive rights is a is an essential factor in uh, in the concept of positivism, or not at no, all? I wouldn't think it has. No, I don't recall that. I mean, I, it's a long time since I read Comte, but I don't, I don't get that out. And my second question is, since you, you say that you don't necessarily believe in um, global warming and climate change, how would you propose um, solutions to protect the environment without government uh, intervening? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm a libertarian, so I would look for private property and contractual solutions. And there are serious environmental problems. One of them is plastics in the oceans. And again, like many things, <laughs> I, I'm not saying this out of xenophobia, but like many things that people complain about, it's mainly China that's the culprit. That's just a fact. Um, so, um, I, so I would say develop property rights in the, in the oceans. But given that that's so far removed from anybody's thinking, I would, I would support some kind of intergovernmental yeah, sell the uh, uh, scheme to um, regulate the, 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 the depositing of plastics in the oceans. <laughs> George! Why, why do so many Americans hate America? I think it's great. Yeah. I don't understand them. I don't really don't understand them. Well, I mean, it, it, it's not just that. It's in every country, there's a section of the left that hates its own country. Left. Uh, it's even, there's even a, a line about it, I don't think I can quote it accurately but from memory, in the Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan, the, the person who uh, despises every country but his own. But it's better, it's more witty than that. Um, it's a well -known, been a well-known phenomenon for several centuries. Uh, so why do they, um, well I mean maybe they're overcompensating for super patriotism, they don't want to, um, they don't want to fall into the trap of being blind to their own countries. Uh, failings, and so they go too far in the other direction. Maybe that's a part of it. I don't know. Justin, uh, you'd mentioned you disagree. You did. Uh, there are a few things about the Old Testament that you did like. What were those things about the New Testament that you? The Old yeah. Testament. The Old Testament. Yes. The New Testament. S excuse me. Old, old, Old Testament. What were the things about the Old Testament? Well, there are. There are. I mean, I'm not quite clear what the question relates to, but I did mention the atrocities committed. Uh, by the Hebrews with God's encouragement in the Old Testament and the, uh, the, the validation of slavery, um, the validation of uh, slaughtering whole peoples and saving only the young women, um, uh, the women and young girls uh, for your recreational use, uh, so sanctioned by God, um, and things like that. So there are, uh, there are undoubtedly, if you were going to say that uh, religion gives rise to um, acts of genocide and so on, then you, you would have to say that uh, the, the, the Old Testament uh, is, um, uh, is no slouch compared with the Quran. They both sure. advocate some... Um, Bob Lichtenberg! Uh, you and Sam Harris uh, demonstrate atheism because to do that, you have to prove the existence of a negative. You have to prove that God does not exist. Justify it's the fact totally that you're an atheist. How do you, how do you justify your atheism? It's only totally possible that there might be an argument or evidence for God that uh, you don't know about or you're close to. And you know, I think both of you are very close to it because you both admitted your... Yeah. Well, your first of all, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I have the philosophical position known as critical rationalism. Uh, which stems from Karl Popper, and it's part of crit critical rationalism that you can never justify anything. Uh, what you can do is you can criticize something and try and refute it, uh, and that, thus you can hope to arrive at the best theory within this current state of knowledge. And I think the best theory we have is that there is no... I mean, I would go further than being an atheist. I would say I don't believe in the existence of a spirit world. I don't think there are any spirits. Um, and uh, I think, and I, and I, I could put forward arguments that support that. I mean, I could say that um, if there were spirits and they interacted with the material world, we should be able to find energy signals or some kind of readings that would show their activities. But we don't find anything like that. Charlie Paydock. Yeah, during the week, David, 
I've been studying this for years. The lecturer said that even the British were appalled by the colonial policies of the Spanish invaders of the Americas. And I and even regarding their policies back home, how can you conceivably maintain that the people that didn't put up with one of the, the worst colonial occupations in the history of mankind, that you had to be an atheist to oppose it? I, I don't Is understand this, your question. I, I just don't you, understand. You, you were saying that these were atheists and they didn't go along with the Spanish. That's why they revolted in Spain and in the Americas. What is your question, Charlie? Are you, are you maintaining that these were, this was not a brutal He did. He said that they were atheists. No, he said they were atheists. And that's uh, why but, they but, revolted. But, I mean, they didn't like the Catholics. The part, part, part of the background of the Spanish Civil War is the Spanish Empire. had all they gone away. There was no Spanish Empire. Uh, the, uh, there was a tiny, there was a Spanish Morocco and one or two islands. But that was it. Spain had lost its empire. So Wait a minute. Are you... I don't I don't understand what you're getting. You said they opposed the Spanish only because they were Catholic. But the people who were doing this were Spanish. Yes, but anybody All right, would have did, did the atheists who attacked the Catholics was it only based on religious grounds or was it based on other reasons as well? It was ideological grounds. Ideological? Was ideological grounds, were there any political or uh, economic yeah, grounds? Yeah, I mean, look, listen, it was part of the, of the political movement in Spain, not, which we call republicanism. Slavery is uh, ideology? That, that they were very, very extreme secularists. Uh, Dave, Dave Travis. Uh, my, I have two questions. One is, you said that Eve ate the forbidden fruit and that you believed it to be, but I didn't hear what you said. Passion, passion fruit. fruit. Oh, passion. It was a joke. It was a joke. Was a joke. Yeah. And everything I say is a joke. I I'm like Donald Trump. Everything I say. Is I just didn't hear what you said. He said passion fruit, but it was. Yeah, I'm aware of that now. Uh, and my other question is if you're a suicide you. bomber. And you're Irish. Do you get 72 bottles of whiskey? Actually, um... Vicki, okay. You can correct me if I finish the air, but I'd like to hear more regarding Sam Harris's fairness or lack of it in critiquing various religions, that he's harder on the Quran than perhaps the Old Testament. And it seemed to me in the end of faith, he was hard on the Protestants and gave Catholics and Jews a pass. Is that just me or did, I think did you he see that? I think he has changed his emphasis a bit since the end of faith on some of these questions. Um, I think, I think, see, uh, I, I could say something now which, which would help to explicate the difference between me and Sam Harris. If we ask ourselves the question, why are there lots of, uh, Muslims committing atrocities, and we don't find so many Christians committing atrocities. Um, basically, I think Sam Harris would say a big part of the answer is because the Quran tells you to go and kill the infidel, right? Uh, I would say it's because, Christia because Christianity, for one, whatever reason, Christianity underwent uh, um, economic growth and capitalist development. Uh, and that leads, in my view, to secularization. And it leads to irreligion. Uh, and so what we need is for, the, is for the Muslim world to have a few centuries of economic growth, uh, ca capitalist right. development. Uh, and that will cause, in about 500 years, them to be just as irreligious as the Christians are. But did Sam Harris particularly attack Protestants more than he attacked the Catholics and the Jews? Do you think he was Well, I think, uh, Protestants I don't really think he did, but I think you could get that impression because uh, at the time, he was trying to make a link between the Muslims who, who had hit the Twin Towers and bigot religious bigotry in American life, and that at the time was mainly viewed as Protestant. So he was talking about fundamentalist Christian. I mean, I think that um, the way, I mean,
the way he refers to fundamentalist and evangelical Christians is quite disgraceful. I think, you know, he, he treats them as though they're insect pests to be exterminated uh, in, the, in the end of faith. Are you good? Yeah, I am good. Thank yes, sir. You. Okay, so, uh, yes, um, free will, no cause and effect. Yes and no, right? Well, I was hope. I, see, I believe in free will, even though I know it's impossible. I was hoping you could help me there uh, with the logic of believing in free will. By the way, uh, Harper's Can you Magus justify your belief in free will? What, what makes yeah, you believe but, yeah, in I know free it's, will? I, know I can't it's impossible. justify anything, but I can give, produce arguments to support free will. Pardon? Can you produce one argument? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I can produce one that takes less than ten minutes to elaborate. But uh, but, but I, I would I would say this that um, uh, arguments against free will have taken a, a different turn in the past twenty to thirty years because they found that uh, by measuring the, what goes on in the brain, they've established that you've made up your mind about something yeah. a second or two before you think you have, and they draw from that the conclusion that you're not in control of your uh, That's not an argument right. against, it's just an explanation of the illusion. I don't see it as an illusion. I think well, you no, are in control no. of your thinking, you do make up your mind. This is a biggie with my, this. I mean, the, Sir, this, this can't be answered in the time period of okay. the q &A. I, I It's a valid you're question, right. but... Right. Uh, my, my, my basic answer would start from an analogy, yeah. something like this. You decide you're going to do one yeah. thing, according to a calculation on your pocket calculator. And if it's above 3.5, the answer's above 3.5, you'll do this. And if it's below 3.5, you'll do that. So you do that, you find the calculation. Now, you made the choice, uh, but it appears to someone looking at it as though the calculator can make the choice. So that would be the beginning of my argument. See, I think the conscious mind is embedded in lots of unconscious little pocket calculators, and it relies upon them. And it and it, uh, it, out, it outsources work to them. Um, and so, I, by this kind of very clever argument, I'm able to reconcile uh, this delay in uh, thinking that you've arrived at a decision. The weather causes well. the weather All right, thank itself, you, sir. Right? Ellen Corley. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is about a theory that the theories that I hold are that, that like, 9 11 was not actually. Muslim, you know, they were Egyptian, but that there was a false flag set up, an inside job arranged by the Israeli American Mossad to take it down and then blame it on the false okay, flag. Okay, what is the question? On, and I, I'm just saying, have you considered this as, I mean, could it be that your interpretation of Muslims and atheism and, and Judaism and Christianity? All these ideologies could have been constructed by as kind of a neoliberal, neoconservative, divide and conquer way to justify their taking over the Middle East for forever war and the well, fourth Reich. I, I, I would have I would have certain questions about that. And my first question would be, why did Osama bin Laden never say this after 9/11? In, on the contrary, he, it, he did deny he knew anything oh, about it. No, he was in the well, hospital. Well, no, he didn't deny yeah, he, knew he was anything not. About it. He could not have organized. Al Qaeda was a, was a facilitator. But these uh, airplane guys could—they were not the ones that did this. This right. took more to go into the various oh, pentagons. I have a question. If you take that evidence away, does your whole argument about world religion and also the idea of Anthony Sutton? came up with the Muslim Brotherhood and Stalin were and the Bolsheviks were created by these same neoliberal forces. They were created to okay. be monsters. You asked your question. Okay. Yeah, so some okay. of these things are constructed. Have you considered that? Have you considered the neoliberals have have created no, I haven't really considered that question. I mean, I think I think the the, the, the Bolsheviks came into existence when they had a split with the Mensheviks in 1903. But who financed them? All right, Wall Street, right, and uh, bankers. They were financed. They got The Western. You've had your own shot. Thank you. They did get they did get some outside financing, but they also uh, raised money, and they raised money by committing a lot of bank robberies. Uh, they the Muslim brother, brother. Yeah. But these were the Jewish bankers. Thank you. Oh, okay. Right. Jews are bad. Now, my question. No, well, they blame it on everybody else. Um, my, my question, uh, Sam Harris wrote a book called Not the End of Religion, but he wrote a book called The End of Faith. Did he define faith? And do you have an issue with his definition of faith? I assume if he wrote a book called The End of Faith, 
there was a definition I of think, what he I means think, as faith. I, I don't recall the precise passage, but I think he would say that faith is believing things without sufficient evidence. All right. Uh, and I think that's a completely wrong way of thinking about the world. I think we always believe a lot of things without sufficient evidence. And it's unavoidable. <laughs> so that's my. So this is critical rationalism. Uh, Karl Popper, right? So oh, okay. um, I think that I believe all kinds of things without sufficient evidence. Okay. Like, I, like um, you know, I I I, be, I believe in um, uh, you know the uh, conservation of momentum. <laughs> I don't have sufficient evidence, and I could never possibly in a billion years momentum. get sufficient evidence. But I believe in it. Conservation of momentum. Yeah, but yeah, one of the basic laws of physics. It's Isaac Newton's, uh, one of his. Okay. All right, Tim Bulger. You know, I didn't really hear of Sam Harris until, you, until I saw you, your posting on ecology of complexes. Why should we give a rat's ass about what Sam Harris thinks? What is versus the importance say, of Sam Harris? Well, I mean, I think it's important to dissect the ideas that are out there okay. and have following. No, why should I care? about what Sam Harris thinks, really especially since I've never Harris? heard of him. Well, I mean, he, he puts arguments that persuade a lot of people. Thank you. And a podcast. Great ideas. Great ideas. Who is there? Has anyone not had a question? Has anyone not had a question? Oh, uh, over sir, here. Sir, I'm sorry. Thank you. He had a question. He had one. Oh, didn't he? No. They all did. I might have uh, misread you. Didn't you say that at one point that uh, suicide bombers are mostly atheists? Did you say that suicide bombers are mostly atheists? I, no, what I said was that most of the suicide bombings conducted in the period from, let's say, 1983 to 2009 were done by atheists. So after that, of course, the, 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 the Tamil Tigers went away, PKK went away. And uh, other kinds of suicide bombs. Would you please uh, clarify PKK? Uh, that's the um, Turkish, 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 uh, the uh, Turkish. Kurdish uh, movement in, re led by Marxist Leninists in Turkey. Uh, so they were atheists who killed Muslims. That wasn't part of my question. Well, it's a question of what he's saying. He might not. That prior you know, to 2009. You, you, you talk about Spain quite a bit. Uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, the persecution uh, that was happening in Spain uh, under the name of, uh, what was it, uh, was it a state-sponsored or was that a religious sponsor? That's an interesting question. Uh, in the period from the Republicans getting into power in early 1936, until the coup, Franco's coup. In that period, it was mainly the government allowing private individuals to do all kinds of things without pursuing them. In fact, what they would, what the government would do, this is the socialists dominated. Well, they weren't, weren't dominated numerically, but the tail wagged the dog. The socialists actually <laughs> controlled the government, even though they were a minority in the Republican government. Um, and they, what they did was, when, it, when somebody was killed by these atheistic leftists, um, they would investigate the victim and their associates. And the, and the climax of this was the killing of, um, what's his name? Forget his name now. Uh, this is what comes with being saying, if you forget this. But the guy who was killed, the big assassination by one of the leading uh, uh, right-wing politicians in Spain, uh, that, led, that was the point where... Um, it became clear that, that, that the left was just going to wipe out its, its uh, opposition. Sir, in the back. So going back in history, just one the little uh, tiny thing. I, I was curious. The, uh, Inquisition, uh, was it was it state-sponsored uh, or religion-sponsored? Well, it was religion-sponsored, the, state, on, did, the state didn't stop it. I mean, you could argue. You Sir, questions. in the back. Charlie, you break your own rules all the time. Uh, <laughs> Sir, in the back. You got two questions. He's Sir, in the back, Who's in the back? The gentleman in, with glasses who's standing up. Okay, let's go. Bye. Can you list five benefits of the major religions heard today? Can you please list five benefits of the reli major religions today? Do, do oh, well, I could. I mean, I could. I'm sure. But I, uh, what would be easiest for me would be. 
to list five benefits of Christianity, since that's the religion I grew up in and I know most about. Let's I would say um, the, uh, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, the music of Palestrina. Um, I would say um, the, uh, the uh, cathedrals in Europe. Um, I would say the uh, foundation of the universities in Europe. That was all church inspired. But do I have one more. Um, I would say um, uh, the, the anti-slavery campaign conducted by the British Empire uh, uh, against the slave trade and against slavery throughout the world. Uh, they're all rooted in Christianity. So I, I can give you lots of benefits of Christianity. And a I could give you disbenefits as well. Andy Anderson. Yeah, my question is, um, how is it uh, possible that you can maintain uh, a level of belief when, uh, like two of the things you talked about tonight, uh, there's massive evidence that what you told us was 180% out of touch with reality. Yeah. You're living in, you're standing in a blizzard claiming you can't see a single snowflake and you can't learn, you haven't learned anything. Okay, are you on drugs, David? What, well, my question is, uh, how, how can you do that? How can you be comfortable? I'm usually, I'm usually on caffeine and I'm occasionally on al alcohol. Uh, but, uh, but generally speaking, um, I went to see my doctor recently for the first time in five years, and he, I told him what I thought. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, you're a medical minim minimalist. <laughs> That's true. So I'm not on drugs. Um, uh, well, how can you possibly believe something that's so wrong is what you're asking. And the answer, I suppose, is because I'm extremely stupid and slow and because I'm blinded by a false ideology. I mean, those are the obvious uh, explanations, aren't they? Um, all right, Tim, uh, right now it okay. is five minutes to eight. How are we doing? Are I think it's time if everybody's got it. Okay, sir. let's take two yes, more sir. here and here, and then we'll go to rebuttals. Yes, sir. Uh, so just uh, as someone who mostly knows Harris from his online work, uh, I know you went through a lot of his arguments, but is there any of his books you would recommend the most, any that you would uh, recommend avoiding the most? And secondly, I don't know if you talked any about, I didn't hear any about uh, his thoughts of secular atheistic uses of meditation. Right. Uh, he is a big proponent of spiritual meditation, even though he's an atheist. And I did look at some of the, I didn't read anything uh, about that, but I looked at a lot of things that he, like talks and things he posted. And um, uh, I'm agnostic on, on that whole area. I, I'm not a, I don't Do you recommend any of his books or any of his good books, good reading, or is there any of his books to avoid? I mean, I, I think if you want to get an idea of where he's coming from, the end of faith is right. still the best. I mean, he said, he said a lot about um, Islam, uh, and he's been very controversial, but he, there's a, the only book that I'm aware of was a dialogue between him and a moderate Muslim. Uh, and it's a bit tedious, I thought. Okay. Uh, so I would say some of his talks on YouTube would give you more of an inkling of, of uh, what he thinks about his life. Last question, so, we'll go to Rebuttals. Something that you would recommend. I, I mean, I read his book on free will, yeah, I mean, and it, uh, it's, it's admirably succinct, but I, but I wouldn't say it's a great philosophy. Final question is George. Why did Nietzsche say God is dead? Uh, Actually, you know, Nietzsche didn't say, Nietzsche, right, Friedrich Nietzsche, did not say God is dead. In his book. What he said was that he had, a, he had the madman who went into the marketplace and shouted that God is dead. Uh, so uh, he had character, so you've got to be careful with what characters say and what the authors are saying. Um, All right, I, think, I, think what, I think what, the way I interpret it, and I might, I might, I'm not an equal Nietzsche expert, uh, but the way I interpret it is God is dead in the sense that the, the concept of God ceases to appeal to intellectuals in the West. Okay. They, they just don't find it at all convincing. Okay. Uh, that's what I think you know. Thank you very kindly. And let's, we go to, a... let's go to rebuttal. <laughs> How many we got for rebuttals tonight? Thank you, Karina, for moderating. Hold on. All right, Andy, get a count, please. Hold your hands up and we'll count. Oh, 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 o
probably allowed enough. We'll go three minutes. Yes or no? three, three minutes or Hard three minutes. Right. Get started and let's go. I will, I will take the first recall tonight while everybody's here. Where is the you have something to say? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, we'll, we'll kick off. It's, it's three minutes a person. Yes. I'd like to say a couple of things. Um, Charlie, shut up. From It stems back from the old English law that silence means consent. When you're silent about something, it means you consent, that you don't object to it. When there's a crime in progress and you pretend you can't see it or see anything, you're complicit in the crime. And the pe people that continue to say there's no global warming, there's no climate change, they're slowing down the progress of the rest of the population that's trying to deal with a crisis. There's overwhelming evidence that is no longer debatable on any kind of grounds that the curve with fossil fuel burning going up in the last 200 years and the, the unnatural global warming, those two curves are right together. The latest pictures came out last fall of the ice melting at the North South Pole in Greenland. And it's a scientific consensus. 99% of the Academy of Sciences all over the world are saying the window of opportunity for us to do anything about climate change closes in 2030. The, this July was the hottest year since they've been keeping Somebody records for the planet. The last 10 hottest years have happened in the last 10 years. To say, to continue to promote the insane idea of standing in a blizzard claiming you can't see a single uh, a snowflake is just intellectual dishonesty and it harms the efforts, it slows down. It's what we call a tobacco strategy. They pay people, intellectual prostitutes, to stand up at a podium and say there's no evidence nicotine is addictive. There's no evidence that there's any kind of harm from smoking. They did that for 40 years to slow down the spread of the knowledge that would cut in the profits of some billionaire predators. Right now, billionaire predators in the fossil fuel industry are paying intellectual prostitutes. I don't know if our speaker is one of them, but they are in Congress. They're paid to be climate deniers. And when you see somebody that appears to be otherwise intellectual, well-educated, denying something is all face reality for an eighth grader to understand, then it's a big, big problem. The other thing is to continue to promote the idea that we were attacked by Muslims from Islam on 9-11 is the grossest distortion of yeah. forensic evidence you, that you can make. Seven buildings were destroyed in New York, not two. All seven of the Trade Center were destroyed with pre-placed explosives and they filmed the first two and said we were attacked by Muslims. What we were shown on television was not any kind of plane crash, it was a crappy Hollywood video. If planes actually went into the towers, they didn't show it on TV. So that's, that's the subject again. Uh, the evidence on those two is just flat out overwhelming. I, I invite our speaker, if you want to have a debate on those two issues, we'll raise money for the college. If he wants to debate me, he can put up a five dollar freeze point, I'll put up a hundred dollar bill and see if the college wins wins some money. Okay? Thank you. Yes, please. He said this guy's bribe. I said I didn't know. Unlike the previous rebuttal, I'm going to speak about Sam Harris and atheism. Um, Atheism is not demonstrated either by Harris or by Speaker Ramsey, Ramsey Steele. Uh, you can't demonstrate atheism because atheism, you, you disprove that something exists and how could you disprove something exists? You have to show it's dead or something physically. Uh, as I stated to him, but he misunderstood the, the argument. You have to, I mean, there might be an argument you just don't understand and you can't comprehend. Or you're close to it, you're probably close to it because he admitted right at the very start he's a filthy materialist and narrow, very narrow-minded. You can only see what physically exists and that's all that's real for him. That's a very narrow view. And there might be a God somewhere, he's just not open to it whatsoever. What about the creator argument? You know, the argument that there has to be a creator of the universe, the Big Bang supports that. The Big Bang says that 13.7 billion years ago, 
There was absolutely nothing. There was no time, no space, no matter. And this has won many Nobel Prizes in physics. And, you know, that argues for a creator. And the designer argument is still strong and getting stronger every day. There's just a grand design in nature, much grander than we had ever thought. And there's other arguments, too. But you have to be open to them. Um, but uh, the, the thinking displayed in the talk showed no... Uh, no regularities, no patterns. He says falsifiability by Karl Popper just says you can't prove a damn thing. Well, no, that's not what Popper said. Popper just says you, um, uh, um, you can't falsify everything. We do have methods of proving beliefs and opinions true, and that's called, and that's, that's called logic. And logic, no one needs to demonstrate even opinions to be better and worse than what others, but we have to understand those, and most people don't have a clue about anything about logic whatsoever, so they have no, they, they, they don't use it whatsoever. Um, but logic couldn't provide a good test. Um, um, all right, my last comment will be because I got some out of time. Who's um, time? Mohammed did write about 72 virgins. You get 72 virgins in paradise, he will. And he added, it would mean virgins forever. No worry there. So I wonder why I came here. Sam Harris, who cares? But I found the talk very interesting, entertaining. I disagreed with certain parts of it. No doubt about it, but that's not what I'm talking about. Suicide Bombers was part of the uh, speaker's uh, talk. And uh, this book, uh, uh, How to Hide an Empire, uh, bears on that. Uh, United States, after World War II, was the superior power, in my opinion and apparently Immerware's opinion. Why didn't we take more colonies? Two reasons. One, the, col the uh, colonies fought back. They wanted to be free. But the second reason is colonies are a pain in the neck. This book bears on that. What he points to is points. Why we have 800 bases. Where the hell are they? Well, they're all over the place, and we're not in many countries. So granted, we are in a couple countries. I should say the United States. I don't agree with what we're doing. But the United States is in many countries, and we shouldn't be according to Emmerware. We should get out of there because there are three or four reasons in this book, if you read it, why we would do that. One of them, synthetics. Rubber. We don't need rubber. We got synthetic rubber. End of story. Who am I gonna put on the show? All right, Mr. Travis. Good evening. Hello, sir. It's a good year, man. TV. Hello. Yes. Listening to the floor, sir. All right. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to point out something that argues for the existence of a God. Uh, to my knowledge, plants don't think. And yet, there is a species of plant that is carnivorous. Uh, you've all heard of the Venus flytrap and the fly lands and the plant closes. But the fact is there are about 40 or 48 different species of plants that eat uh, flying insects that will land in the plant and either get stuck to it and then digested by the plant's fluids or uh, will be forced down into the plant and be uh, digested. Uh, this would argue very much in favor of a designer 
a creator, as it were. The plant can't say, well, let's see, I'm going to develop in such a way here where I can catch insects so I can continue to live. The plant does that because it was designed to do that. And if it was designed to do that, then there had to be a designer. And if there had to be a designer, that would be a god. So uh, there are a whole bunch of catch-22s like that in existence that argue for the existence of a god. <coughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay. You've never heard of Next. natural selection? <laughs> in nature? Been around for a few years. Thank you, David, for returning for another interesting, enlightening, and entertaining talk. <laughs> Some people in the reality based community, people who believe solutions emerge out of judicious study of discernible reality, enlightened principles, empiricism, etc., believe that that's how we come to conclusions. This is a quote by Karl Rove. Rove goes on to reveal uh, what's at the center of people who uh, are in denial that there is uh, corporate theft, corporate murder, corporate egocide happening, and of course corporate uh, interpretation of peace on earth, good world towards all, which I have a problem with fundamentalism. I don't have a problem with faithism, really. People who want to practice faith, that's awesome. Practice your faith. But this is what Rove says. That's not the way the world really works anymore. We are an empire now. We create our own reality, and while people are studying that reality judiciously as you will, we will act again creating other new realities which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. We are history's actors, and you will be all left to just study what we do. So um, the onus is on we the people to declare that that's an unacceptable way of uh, coming to a conclusion of facts, of history, of math, of common sense, of basic dignity, and interpretation of democracy and justice. You can't just make it up as you go along. You actually have to have some list of criteria that uh, we all agree on. Um, Every election season, uh, we have a big, big choice to not listen to corporate media, not read it, you know, reject those airwaves, reject those print waves. Every election season, we have a chance to vote our values, uh, disregarding what's electability, which I don't know what that means. I guess that means when CNN tells you, you better vote for the Trojan horse left or the Trojan horse right, and if you don't, yeah, you're kicked out of the, uh, the group think uh, cocoon forever banished to the never world because you disobeyed the masters of uh, Karl Rove's mindedness. Uh, and the big thing too is uh, we got to stop having this rule that if you're rich you've got the best ideas. The best ideas uh, throughout history usually are from the working class because the working class had the greatest proximity to where if it's good, it has an exponentially positive impact on quality of life, and if it's bad, it has an exponentially detrimental impact on life. So thank you to a great talk, David Ramsey Steele, once again, and in the Latin phrase, Pax Wobisco. All right. Tim, that was within three. All right, ready? Pax Wobisco. Thanks, Peter. My name is Raj Patel, and it's a long time I spoke here. Uh, when I was new here, I took a philosophy class, uh, and uh, first day on a first class, and in the very beginning, professor asked a question: How many? How many of are you are Christian? And almost 500 hand went up, but not mine. The second question that he asked: How many people believe that uh, Christ teaching is practical? He advised somebody to follow it. Nobody raised hand except me. So that is the status of our religion. So when you talk about this, is how little understanding we have, or how people can people can describe philosophical books about Christianity, Bible, everything they can do it. But when it comes to real practice, 
is not there. And this problem is our every single stage. Our understanding of foreign country, our understanding of our culture or foreign culture or different culture within America. I give one example which I, for, for a few years back, uh, there was a Sariya, Sariya, Muslims, and Sariya. Big deal. Every woman say, I don't want to have a Sariya. America taken over and I will follow Sariya. Okay, reality is that if you, all, if you are Jew or you know about the language of Halka, it, 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 Halka or Halka, whatever, it is the same as Sariya. Okay, it, there, is a, there is a difference in it. Mind, uh, what do you call it, the cultural differences, but not real. And it was false. And, and right now, second thing, Saudi Arabia is large, cultural family large, and uh, Israel, yeah. they are very similar. You know, it, they have a restriction, actually, actually uh, Saudi Arabia had codified them. Okay, other, other thing I want to say, Muslim violence, look, if Muslims have a Big military like we have, the devil will be committing suicide. They will be fighting with the guns and planes and nuclear weapons. Okay, and uh, other thing I have that uh, meditation is a not a religion thing; it is a cultural thing. Any meditation has no, no religion. So that particular thing, I think it wasn't right. And. Uh, Oh, he got skunked, huh? huh? <laughs> the, the, the interest in, before, before I came here, one of our members, I have a running feud about this a Christianity thing, and uh, and so, uh, you know, and uh, we, we are our friend, but looks like it's, it's a running to breaking point. And he says that, well, you know, this is what I was taught, and so Jesus is the thing, and these are the teaching, and that's a, and, and he was saying, his point was that, I'm sorry, just one minute. And his point, point was that, that, uh, that in school teaching should be that monogamous, straight marriage only allowed. You know, and I, th I told him that this kind of a hate, hate speech. Anyway, thank you. All right. Well, All right. Next. Yeah, we got it. David, get up there. Go ahead. Oh, all right. Whatever. Christian. I want to thank the speaker for a very interesting talk. Uh, it's covered a lot of ground, raises a lot of questions. Uh, and we could be all here, here all night long and several days to come covering everything that he, he talked about. I come from a very simple place. Christianity is the only religion where you have a relationship with a living God. The purpose of prayer is to line my will up with his will. say a lot of things, what I'm going to do is let you all know that I'm praying for you. Hallelujah. Collectively, individually. The Lord is telling me that he's going to do something miraculous in each and every one of your lives in the very near future. Some of you are going to have a Damascus Road experience and do a 180 degree turn. Watch for it, it's coming. What they talk about, climate warming, what's going on in the world. Lake Michigan in the last six years is up six feet. I saw a picture in the 70s, Mount Kilimanjaro in February, with a lot of snow on it. That's their uh, summer season. In the early 2000s, I saw another picture with a lot of less snow on it. Now, Florida, the highest point is only 340 feet above sea level, about half of what it is here. How soon is Florida going to be underwater? There are a lot of things I'm praying about. 
<laughs> you let me know what you need prayer for, and I'll pray for it. I can only see the answers very quickly. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right, next, David Zucker. First of all, I would like to thank David for his presentation. As usual, I didn't agree with much of it, but you are such an interesting speaker that in a sense it doesn't matter. Um, with regard to the previous speaker, I sincerely want to thank him because some of us here, we need all the help we can get. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the comments that were made about how the reason why Franco won the Civil War was because atheism was unpopular. Well, that may have been, been a factor, and that may have been part of it, but a good part of it was due to the fact that the ruling classes in Spain did not take kindly to the introduction of freedom and democracy into yeah. that country, and that they enlisted the help of the Nazis and the Italian fascists exactly. to put Franco into power. Indeed, if you saw the episode on Franco that ran on the Dictator's Playbook series on public television a couple of months ago, they talked all about this. Finally, with regard to global warming, let me make sure I understand this. The rainforests are burning. Uh, as uh, the previous speaker noted, and several others have noted, Glaciers and the ice caps everywhere are melting, and there's no global warming? No, I don't think so. There's global warming, and we need a crash effort right now, yes. comparable to what yeah, we right did, now. did 50 some odd years ago to put, man, put people on the moon. And yes, people actually did go to the moon, Charlie. Yeah, that's full on. The hell it is. Hollywood. <laughs> well, well, was busy delivering his silly little talk. I stayed home uh, and watched the Nova presentation on chasing the moon, yeah. which was uh, far more yeah. interesting than Ted could have come up yeah. with. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Yeah. All right, oh, all right. Johnson. You, you fell for it. No, you <laughs> did. Look, lion and sinker. Yeah, hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, I love the College of Complexes. I've been coming here the last few years. I think that free speech is uh, the uh, is the solution to trying to sort out these philosophical big questions. Um, you know, and thank you. I actually agree that it's very interesting uh, your speeches, um, and it does help us clarify our points of difference. Um, I I personally think that. Uh, you know, as I investigate these questions, um, I was unique in that I was raised Christian, but uh, um, Presbyterian, uh, but also then my mother married an atheist, so I kind of always became kind of right in the middle, you know, um, maybe agnostic or uh, seeking meaning. But um, I think that, uh, and actually what I've come to is science and religion, science is the new religion. I wrote a paper about that and it, it does make sense. Also, um, uh, you know, it's a dialectical method is I had to use that. And I think that socialism actually, I saw, heard this smart guy talk about dialectical reasoning. I think that's what we need. There was awakening with Hegel um, and this idea of, it's. He gave an example of cancer. You know, we're doctors are taught it's a cancer, burn it, take it out. That's all you can do. But there's a we could have a cultural conversation that was more thesis, antithesis. You, you kind of look at the history. Uh, and my my big thing is, it, 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 like Andy said, you know, are you paid to propagate this uh, theories? And I, I do think there's been a lot of money spent on neoliberal uh, propaganda. And it's really revisionist Zionism. It uh, came out in 1948, uh, the, the Iron Curtain idea. Uh, great books I've talked about here, um, you know, 50 years of 9-11, uh, you know, from Kennedy to 9-11. Um, 
there really has been a vast right conspiracy. It's not just a theory, and it's been well supported by Operation Mockingbird, and you know the the media is you know all aligned with covering up the reality of basically when Hitler when the war ended he left the lead behind armies with uh, Gladio NATO Gladio Team B um, you know Kissinger was all involved in Brezhnev and it's from the left and the right and the theory is divide and conquer you know we'll we'll say here's what lefties think here's what righties think and um, this is what I disagree with primarily that at one point, you know, under Hegel or whatever, there was, people are all trying to find the similarities in their thinking. I don't know why we need to be divided in religion. Actually, the, one of my ideals in the end of my journey is to get to the Supreme Court and convince them that communism is like a religion. Politics is a religion. And they have no right by that, that uh, amendment to war on religion. You know, they, as um, Adam Curtis said in a great documentary series, Power of Nightmares, America needed an enemy. And um, so he had, you know, Leo Strauss, the neoconservative, and he had the um, Al Zakaria, you know, the, the one who influenced Osama bin Laden. And it, it was a perfect contrast. Two fundamentalists, you know, America's this and the Cali is this, and um, and then they come up with Muslim Brotherhood. They, you know, ISIS. They, they, they. All the evidence is we. Those were constructed because we needed an enemy. We needed an excuse to take all the oil. They needed a new Pearl Harbor. So that's the evidence of investigation, not just deduction. All right. Yeah. yeah. I hope they took notes. <laughs> <laughs> no. didn't take any notes there, Charlie. I am going to take a stage tonight. I'm my own official religion and belief system. I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I will be attending that belief tomorrow morning by attending Springbrook Community Church in Huntley, Illinois. Christianity is the only religion that lets you have a relationship with God and it doesn't cost you anything except you have to accept Jesus into your heart and life. My own testimony goes back to a classic conversion moment when I was a sophomore in college. And it took me a long time to rethink my views to get more, to, have, to be more in conveyance with Christianity than what I was told. I'm also a firm believer that the claims of God can be proven scientifically. And I don't think I'm a dummy that says I cannot believe it. You know, I don't uh, believe things lightly. You know, many of you know the decision I made about the thorium molten salt reactors and how there could be a big, yeah. big, uh, a, a big way to solve certain problems with our energy future. I don't take that lightly. I'll be going to a convention in October to meet with some physicists about it. Also, I too pray for the college and everybody else. And what you may not know, this, is that the videographer for the Dallas campus too is also a Christian. If you look at his site and his YouTube channel, he does a lot of propagation of the faith from a midweek service call. It's from a small church group that meets in a, uh, in a I, I, I forget the name of it, but it's a small uh, diner that they meet in and they have 45 minutes of praise and worship and sermons and everything else. So we're quite common here throughout the college and also in the Dallas campus. And yes, I'll be praying for you. All right. Uh, yeah, you, you, you have a lot of prayers here, David. That's right, we need all the help. We need all the help. Hi, I'm Steve. Uh, this is my uh, uh, second time attending. Uh, so I'm kind of a... Uh, new to the, the give and take of uh, free environment. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. i got to lean in. I tend to talk quietly. First, I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, you remind me of my dad. Uh, my dad is, uh, is a scientist. Uh, he taught chemistry here in Chicago. Uh, he also was a Howard 
Cherubim and a, uh, probably an agnostic order of atheists. My mother uh, was a Lutheran. This is just to give you some background of where, where my thought process is coming from. So, um, I'm just going to comment on one area, which is kind of a, one of my interests, uh, global warming. Um, I really don't think that they have addressed um, whatever you believe on the left, on the right, whether you believe in global warming or not, they really have not addressed the cycles where it goes warm during the Roman period, it goes warm during the uh, medieval warming period, and now it's getting warm again. There's sort of an odd cycle that seems to occur more or less with uh, frequency. Um, when they have actually taken emails from some of the very high level people who say that global warming is happening, which I believe it is, um, they say they can't explain medieval warming and they can't explain Roman warming. So I have a science background. I think Roman warming is occurring. I think that it's a mix of a natural cycle. Probably we're also aggravating it because of our carbon emissions. That's kind of how my, my view on it. Um, so my, my key thing though is I think there's a moral issue on global warming. If you are a third world country or a country that is not as developed, where we have been dumping carbon more or less innocently into the atmosphere for over 100 years, and we have a vastly um, advanced society with superior medical care and infrastructure, and on and on it goes. And then you look at a country that has people that are dying because they don't have access to, to medical care. It's a moral issue that is not addressed in the global war. So, last question I have is, I'm not asking for an answer, Tonight, I'm asking just a question, and it's not directed at any particular individual or the group as a whole. I want to know where the $3 that we pay every day goes. Where does it go? I know it goes to, some of it goes to expenses, but I also want to know what, when the money is given, what is done with it after it leaves our hands. All right. Charlie, All right. Go. We'll uh -huh. break it down for you. All right. That's kind of insulting, you know. It really is. Uh, and using the microphone that I purchased and gave to the college, and <laughs> or, you know, this guy shows up, and it is an insult. And we videotape you using the thousand-dollar projector that I. I purchased and went to the college, Just write it down. and then a jumok like this shows up. There's nothing inside. You know uh, the printed schedules you were getting there. I was oh, turning the quick printer paying for you know. Well, they so, write it down. Uh, you want to know where it goes? It goes for you. Write it down. You know you want a list. You know. Yeah. You want a few other more expenses? You know that we get. You know. Yeah. Uh, but General. you just show up and oh, demand come on. something. You know, maybe kind of loaded. Okay. All right, I'm going to get back to top. Personal right. attacks. You know, yeah, yeah. Right. 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 personal attack. Yeah. Well, I demand to know. I demand to know. All right, come again. Yeah. Yeah. Come here with a. Conduct yourself like a gentleman. Well, yeah, why do you do All right, we've been at atheism many times at the college. I know the six basic arguments for the existence of God. And that's basically all they are, are arguments they have to memorize. Uh, amazingly tonight, you know, this expression I use, you look at what I look at, you do not see what I see. Amazingly tonight, now there was a, there was a thing, a, a scientist a century ago, who looked at nature, the plants and species in nature, and he came up with something that called, called evolution, which disproves an awful lot of organized religions explanation of the universe tonight i heard of a guy who looked at plants and actually came up with theology and the existence of god that's amazing why well, I, I just can't believe what i heard here but that makes us the college of complexes uh global warming i've been agreeing for an awful long time uh you know uh, what I heard tonight, and I didn't get to ask the question, but I actually heard that 
the global warming or the efforts of the ecological movement would have harmful effects upon infants and infanticide. One of the things, and I give lectures on this, being lectured with the Climate Reality Project is that the one thing that makes the Green New Deal unique is that it talks about and tries to mitigate the effects of global warming on poor communities or distressed communities and other segments of the demographics, in particular the young and the old. This is where it spends an awful lot of time uh, uh, going over. And then to say that, well, the efforts of mitigation of global warming, uh, no, it, that's just the contrary. That's the one thing that I found interested on, and I'll be speaking again in September at another group on this, but no, that's what I found most interesting about this. The effects of global warming are not uniform, and the Greens certainly have taken that into account. I, I'll tell you the one thing that really bothers uh, the people I can never understand is the slike of the Greens in the very beginning. I remember hearing it for the first time. I said, why are you posting like eco stuff? And even the libertarians. Well, I guess, guess what? The thing that really bothers them, that really, really, really bothers them, is that we are more correct. <laughs> and you know, what we said in the beginning, unless you do something about the environment, there's going to be some pretty negative consequences, and they have proven correct. Now, what you have to do is close your eyes, and it might not feel real good, but you got to admit and say, you know, hey, maybe I should have listened to Chuck when he was talking at the college five <laughs> yeah. years ago. And last of all, uh, just two quick things. Regarding religion, during the week I was refreshing myself on that very unusual episode of Christianity. I'd been there as, as the Salem witch trials. I was reading up on it. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, the Salem witch trials could happen again any place. There's been no constraints on it. And last of all, it's finally been exposed that you under bribe. How much are you getting to put down global warming? <laughs> Admit it now. He's getting, talk about us getting paid. You fess up. Where are you going with all that money? All right. no, I'll course, tell you that no, no. place and okay. two critters. Last well. rebuttal. we got to right. give David a chance. After. All right. Thank you very much. Last rebuttal. <laughs> David, get ready to speak after this. The uh, Ukrainian genocide was a horrific tragedy in human history, and collective, collectivized farming didn't work in that instance. Uh, regarding uh, those who think the terror attacks of September 21, 2001 were not carried out by Al-Qaeda, 7-Eleven is a part-time job. Uh, it was, Ms. Corley mentioned Jewish bankers in 9-11. What the fuck? How can that not be uh, interpreted as anti-Semitism? What do you think, banking? Time? Regarding Andy's oh, rebuttal, God. silence is not always uh, consent, as we've learned from the Me Too movement. A lot of social pressure, threats, disbelief, victim, victim blaming will uh, prevent a lot of women from coming forward, so that's not always the case. Uh, regarding Dr. Steele's talk, I enjoy Sam Harris because I think he's provocative. Uh, he doesn't really fit in any sort of box, and he's, he makes critiques of the left from the left. If I'm being rational, I would say I'm an agnostic rather than rather than an atheist, and I because I, uh, I think that atheism does require a leap of faith. And if my uh, atheist friends want to dissuade me from that, I'm, I'd like to hear that. Um, uh, I, I if I am taking a leap of faith, I guess I'd say I'm a deist. I believe uh, without proof of some sort of prime mover or first cause. And I recommend reading Thomas Paine's The Age of Reason, which explores that topic. Um, and as a side note, I am a huge fan of Jesus Christ. Um, I also want to uh, mention um, the passing of David Koch. Uh, may he rest in peace. He was a philanthropist who gave a lot of money for cancer research. He was a patron of the arts. He's pro-immigrant, pro-equality rights for LGBT folks pro-choice, pro-free markets, pro-limited government. I don't support everything the man did, but it's uh, undeniable that he helped uh, the American libertarian movement sprout. 
I'm particularly sad because I'll no longer receive any paychecks from being his shill anymore. And I assume Dr. Steele is, is uh, sad about that as well. Uh, thank you. All right. Can I get a quick break? Just count it, Tim. There are actually 13 people. He's been standing in line waiting, so he'll make right. it quick. Okay. okay. We'll keep we'll it on. snappy. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Um, we had a lot of other stuff brought up, but I'll start with the Harris. Um, I also got the impression that he could be, you know, glib. And I say this as an atheist who's anti-religious. Uh, and when he was pressed, uh, Harris, I mean, during question and answers, during interviews, and many of the videos I've seen since I hadn't read any of his books yet, uh, he would admit that, well, yeah, secular forces could also be malevolent or oppressive or genocidal, but you'd have to kind of prod him until he got there. Um, and I remember I once saw an event at the uh, Bassett's Multimedia. They had a screening of religious films, and Dr. Martin E. Marty from U Chicago was there. And when people asked him about all the horrible things religion had done, he said, yeah, well, you can take away religion, but then secular people can do very, very horrible things, too. I actually wrote my thesis in college on uh, the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution, so it was nice to hear uh, in an unexpected setting the Cristero Rebellion, uh, or La Cristiada, uh, Viva Cristo el Rey. Um, and the, the, the harsh anti-clericalism of the uh, Calles regime, uh, and Cardenas was a general then, uh, really helped turn Mexico inside out already a decade after a revolution that had turned them upside down. I think it's also worth noting, though, there and in Spain and other places, that the Catholic Church had been pretty authoritarian, uh, you know, had access to the levers of power in colonial Mexico, or, or in much of the 19th century, they fought over this a few times, too. Uh, the name you were fumbling for, Doctor, might have been Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, the death that's triggered the start of the Spanish Civil War, the son of the former dictator, or the leftist police lieutenant. Oh, all right. I, oh, they killed him after the war started. Primo de Rivera was the head of the Oh, his father had been... Right. Sorry, that one's probably off the microphone. Uh, one note for last week for Ed Rios, who I think I saw in back, uh, he'd asked about how money changed value in ancient times before paper currency and central banks. Debased coinage was the answer. They would put more impurities into the coins to, uh, you know, thin, uh, spread around the money supply with a thinner value. Uh, Ellen, I don't think we need to be naive about the nature of the Soviet bloc. I don't know if you were mixing up Brezhnev with someone else. Brezhnev ran the Soviet Union from the mid-60s no, to the early 80s. Brzezinski. Okay, it's a yeah. very different name and nationality. But you could equally be critical of how the United States conducts its foreign affairs and not be naive about how the Soviets conducts theirs. Now, if we treated politics as religion, uh, you'd also have constitutional grounds for unlimited donations to political parties. So you could get to the same outcome by a different avenue as we have now. Uh, and to the gentleman in back who doubted the Holodomor, the Ukrainian genocide, there's actually a man who's come here less often these days, Ari Sianibas, who's a, an over-the-hill Greek-American communist who actually celebrates the Ukrainian genocide as Stalin's appropriate revenge against those disobedient pig the farmers. Big lie. The big lie. No, he thinks it's very true and he's the dancing on their graves, genius. The big lie. Sorry for shouting at you. And Charlie, I put in my request for this book to be talked about December 7th by Force of Thought, Memoirs of Economist Janusz Kornai. Thanks. All right, David, you got about four minutes. Randall Kirsch. Uh, our speaker will give the, the last word and then make an announcement here. Start collecting your belongings as soon as he's through talking. We have to move to the back and let him clean this. We're running late tonight. we got to be out of here in the next five, six minutes. Okay. Thank you. All right, David. Yes, well, several people mentioned uh, global warming, so I'll just make a couple of points about that. First of all, I don't know how inefficient the people at Exxon are. I keep on telling them, look, this is my bank number, this is my address. I, I still don't get any checks. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, this, uh, you know, it's my name, it, Ramsey is with an A Y. Steel has an E on the end. I keep trying to make it clear to them, but they haven't so sent well. me any money. Uh, I'm afraid. So well. I wish they would. Um, one thing, I'll uh, just make a couple of scientific oh, no, points about global warming. One is that um, when people say this is the hottest on record, 
You have to understand that what they mean is the thermometer record, and that goes back about 140 years. Uh, there were thermometers, certain, like the, the central England goes back earlier, but enough thermometer readings, especially in the southern hemisphere, to give you some estimate of the global uh, temperature. That only goes back less than 140 years. So you know, <clears throat> that doesn't mean we don't know what temperatures were like earlier. And we do know that it was often warmer than today. And we know that for most of the Earth's history, it's been warmer than today. Um, but uh, the, but those, those things are done with isotopes of, of oxygen and with beryllium tannin, but these kind of readings. Also with looking at the tree line, look, also looking at fossils. Um, so all these things come together. We do, but it's a lower resolution. We don't see the same detail that we get with thermometer. Uh, uh, so that's one thing things you have to understand when people say to you, um, it's, it's, this, is the, the <clears throat> this is the warmest on record. You have to understand that means in the last 140 years. And even if, the, of course there has been warming over the last 140 years, but even if there hadn't been, given such a short time span of 140 years, you'd be breaking records, both hot and cold, all the time. You know, it would be in this town, this would be the hottest uh, December ever or whatever. Uh, and in this town, it would be the coldest. I mean, you do, in fact, break records for cold every year, as well as for, for hot. So uh, you get slightly more with hot because it has been getting warmer. Um, so um, uh, this is, um, I, I, will debate any, I will debate anybody on global warming. I would just make one qualification to that. If it's a climate scientist, I, you, I wouldn't debate. I would find a, a skeptical climate scientist. There are hundreds of skeptical climate scientists, and I can easily find one. Uh, but if it's someone uh, like you, I'll debate you on global warming. And I warn you, I will annihilate you. Um, <laughs> All right. Who wants to see that debate? Raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is worth three dollars. <laughs> uh, be worth three dollars. All right. Skeptical <laughs> scientists all work on, for on the, on, the, on the God hypothesis, if you read my book, Atheism Explained, which you can get on Amazon, uh, I go through all the standard arguments and some of the non-standard ones. And I both for and against the existence of God, because there are there are arguments against the existence of God, because uh, there are arguments like uh, that some of the attributes of God are contradictory. Like if God is all-knowing and all-benevolent, uh, and all powerful, then why do we have so much suffering? That's an argument against the existence of God, uh, get on a certain definition of God. Um, the Venus flytrap, I, that, you know, there, I don't see any problem there. If there's, once you, once you uh, agree that it's possible that a plant might have uh, the ability to take in chemicals uh, from the outside and use them, then, uh, then from, it, once you grant that possible ability, then natural selection would could develop in a more uh, specialized okay. direction. Dave, we got to wrap it up. Uh, uh, okay, I'll just make one point then. Studies of prayer have shown that it's totally ineffective. They've actually done studies where they they get a lot of people. A lot of people pray for people who are dying of cancer, and they find out the remission rate. And, it, and it, there is absolutely no difference uh, whether um, uh, that people are praying for them or not. So prayer. Science shows. Okay. <laughs> I hate that kind of uh, okay. thing. But right. scientific studies have shown that prayer is totally ineffective. Okay, gavel us out. Andy, thank you, David. Our speaker, hands real please. For a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, please gather your belongings and come toward the back as fast as you can. We got to get out of here. All right, come forward and go to the right to see you next time. I'm coming here.